This is Jim Hendershot again. It's time to uh, uh, study lecture number nine. The topic uh, on this lecture is magnetic materials for electric machines. Active magnetic materials in, uh, in used in electric motors and generators consist of two types. They're known as soft materials and hard materials. The soft materials are easily magnetized and demagnetized, and they're used for rotor and stator core components. And they're easily magnetized to carry the flux in the circuit and easily demagnetized. And hopefully the, we can choose materials that have low losses during that magnetization and demagnetization process. And uh, we, we like to use uh, soft materials that are capable of high flux densities and materials that don't cost too much. <clears throat> the other ma active magnetic materials known as hard magnetic materials or permanent magnets. The best grades uh, exhibit very high hysteresis residual flux where the best soft materials exhibit the lowest residual hysteresis flux. And all electric machines require conductors of electricity and copper is usually the one that's used except uh, uh, in the case of caged induction machines, IM machines, aluminum has been used for many years and it's a reasonable choice because of it, the simplicity of its casting ability. Here's a very very nice picture of the BASE curve that uh, with both classes of materials plotted on the same uh, graph. We have the vertical axis B, that's the, the magnetic flux density in the material, and the, uh, the horizontal axis is the H axis, or in Orsteds, and that's the, the axis where you, magnetize, you apply an external field to magnetize the magnetic material or demagnetize, and demagnetize it. And you see there's two different shapes here. The soft materials, that's the the, the one that stands up like a pogo stick in red there, it has a very narrow hysteresis band. The width of that red band is very narrow, and that's what we want. But uh, And pay particular notice of the shape of the curve. It's almost saturated uh, right at this point here. It's considered to be completely saturated out here, but there's not a whole lot of difference between the flux density between this point and this point, and you pay a heck of a price in uh, ampere turns or magnetizing force to uh, get the flux density from here to here. Now, in the case of a permanent magnet, that's the hard material, that's the green one here, that guy uh, exhibits peak flux densities much lower than soft materials, but it has this real high hysteresis uh, bandwidth here so that when when you magnetize it it comes up to this point and then when you turn the uh, power supply off it comes back to here so this is a residual magnetism that left in the magnet and this is the type of material you want <clears throat> uh, there's uh, there's uh, several forms of these soft materials they come in uh, cindered grades, that's fine, pure iron powder, very pure with all the carbon taken out. Carbon, carbon content in, in iron ore causes residual magnetism, so uh, they use electric furnaces, very high uh, quality, uh, quality control electric furnaces to, uh, to uh, make uh, electrical steels out of iron ore and they extract all the carbon out in very low percentage. So, And to uh, reduce core losses, they add a little silicon back in. So uh, uh, the uh, uh, sintered grades are, are powder versions of those materials, and they can be shaped in complicated uh, configurations and, uh, and, uh, and fired and, and cured in that state. And... Uh, the uh, punched iron materials are made from electrical steels that have been rolled out to thin, accurate gauge thicknesses. The most uh, common ones are 25 gauge, 26 gauge, and 29 gauge. And these are uh, 20, 25 gauge is, uh, is uh, 20, 
uh, I think that should be 24 gauge, not 25. But anyway, uh, it, the 24 gauge is 25 thousandths thick, 26 gauge is 18 and a half thousandths thick, and 29 gauge is 14 thousandths thick. Then you have, those are the oriented grades. Uh, the, no, those are the non-oriented grades. Uh, this is backwards here. The M3 grades that are real thin, those are oriented uh, grades, and the, uh, the M19 grades are non-oriented. -or that graph is uh, backwards. I'll have to correct that. But uh, <clears throat> uh, there's also a class of materials, of amorphous materials, trade name known as met glass, and these have very low core losses, but their maximum flux density is quite low. The P, they, they run around 1.5 tesla instead of uh, 2 tesla, 2.1 tesla like the, like the other grades there. Uh, here's a, uh, a, uh, a kind of a summary of, of the different materials. Here's pure iron that is used in sintered parts in this picture here. Uh, these two pictures here are pictures of uh, sintered uh, pole pieces, this one has coils wrapped around it, so these are centered pole pieces that are replaced laminations. You put a bunch of these together to make a stator. Then there's silicon iron, phosphorus iron, and, and nickel iron, and all of these grades can be, are available by a company called Hoganus, and uh, they make these powdered materials that are, can be centered into these shapes. Uh, here's an example of uh, of an actual stator that's been centered out of a trade name material called Sololoy, and it's made by this Hoganus, a Swedish company. Here's a, 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 a BH curve, a magnetization curve of an example of the Sololoy, the blue line here, and the red one compares it with, uh, with uh, 29 gauge uh, silicon steel lamination. You can see it takes more ampere turns, amps per meter, takes more electrical power to magnetize uh, this this uh, uh, solmaloy material, but it gets up to a pretty decent flux density. The silicon steel takes less energy to magnetize it, so that's uh, that's significant for a brushless or for an induction motor maybe, but not so not so important for a permanent magnet motor because it's magnetized from the magnet flux, not electromagnetic flux. Uh, there are uh, 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 ASTM versus uh, IEC uh, uh, standards for gauges and core losses. Here's a summary of those. Uh, the uh, the uh, uh, IEC gauges are 35 millimeter, half a millimeter, and 0.65 millimeter. And the closest to those gauges we have in the United States are. 14 thousandths, 18 and a half thousandths, and 25 thousandths. Uh, like for example, the, uh, the half a millimeter grade is 0 0.0197, I believe it is, is, is half a millimeter as opposed to 0 0.0185, but they're, they're close enough to be interchangeable. And uh, here's some uh, uh, core loss data, standard data, watts per kilogram at 50 hertz, that's typical of European and Japanese uh, grid frequencies. And here's the core losses at 60 hertz. And here's some, some comparison of those core losses per pound. Uh, the uh, electrical steel, uh, this is an electrical steel chart that compares the old 1996 uh, ASTM grades. Uh, the, old, the grades prior to 1996 were called these M grades, these I think most Americans are most familiar with these M19, M15, and and the, they have new classifications of those as of 1966. But the equivalent European grades are listed in this column, and they're not exactly the same. You see, they're similar because the actual thickness is is different. For example, a uh, a an American grade uh, of a half a millimeter, as I was saying before, is 0.0185 thick whereas the equivalent European grade is 0 0.0197 inches thick. So being it a little thicker, there's a little uh, difference in the core losses, the industry standard core loss for those materials at 60 and 50 hertz uh, at 1.5 tesla flux density. The, uh, the manufacturers of the steel uh, they they issue these uh, 
plots of the BH data, but they plot it on log paper, so the shape of the curve is very misleading. It looks like uh, uh, these materials uh, don't saturate so fast. You know, this, this makes it look like a gradual slope because they plotted the test data on log paper. But uh, really, uh, go, go back to this uh, picture here. Remember what I mentioned before is when you get to uh, 1.34 uh, Tesla, you are saturated. It takes uh, very little energy to get it up to that flux density, but an off about a hundred times, five hundred times, a thousand times to get it up to to 2.1 Tesla, and and that's very misleading on this uh, this standard sort of a, a graph that you get from the steel company, so I want to caution you on that. Uh, now the uh, for medium high frequency machines we've got some uh, some other uh, data here on on the losses that uh, remember the previous data showed 1.5 Tesla at 50 Hertz and 60 Hertz. Here's some newer data on uh, very thin steels for high frequency applications and they give the uh, the uh, the flux density is still limited to one tesla but at least they give you some loss data in watts per kilogram at uh, 400 hertz and 2500 hertz here's comparison of 50 400 and 2500 now what's interesting about this is just pick a grade and you can see how drastic the core loss goes up as a function of frequency it's really uh, it's really significant. That's very important. And, and the frequency we're talking about is the RPM frequency, you know, the number of poles, pole pairs divided by 60 times the RPM, it, it gives you the frequency. And one of the things that uh, helps the reduce the core losses is to coat the lamination with insulation materials, uh, uh, very thin layers. It's got to be thin layers, it can't be too thick or it uh, interferes with the uh, flux carrying capacity of the core itself because too much, you don't want much of the axial length taken up in a laminated core, you don't want much of the length taken up by the insulation material because you can't get flux from the insulation material, that's the purpose of it. But it insulates against eddy currents and these are our coatings that are applied uh, usually to only one surface of the lamination because if you stack all the laminations in the same direction as they come out of the die, then you have one insulation coating between any two adjacent lamps. So you've got to be careful that you don't flip some of them over when you stack them. Otherwise, you don't have uh, uh, <clears throat> insulation between them. Uh, the, uh, I mentioned before this met glass material, which is a very soft iron, it's an amorphous material, it's a strange manufacturing process and uh, it's very thin, it's difficult to punch because it tends to shatter when you punch it so uh, it's best used in slit strip form that you could wrap up and make cores out of it. One, one of the possibilities is to make uh, uh, stator cores for axial flux machines because you can wind the core up out of this strip material, this met glass, you can wind it up uh, like a roll of tape and then and then uh, bond all that together and hold it in a fixture, put it on a milling machine and mill the slots in it where you put the coils. So uh, uh, that that's one way that uh, you can use it very nicely. But it's limited in terms of the, the permeability is very high as you can see, but the, uh, but the uh, Satur its ability to saturate carry flux is quite limited. 1.56 tesla is as high as it goes as compared to uh, uh, silicon steels which go up to 2.1 tesla. So that's a significant difference. Now now let's talk about magnets. Let's, it's we've talked enough about uh, soft materials. Let's talk about hard materials. And, and so I'm showing you a picture of, of a magnet. And a magnet's a hard material in that once you magnetize it, 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 the, it has a residual flux and, uh, and of course there's polarity associated with magnetization as there is with soft materials. Uh, there's north and south poles on the magnet it turns out those are very important how those are oriented in various uh, permanent magnet situations or configurations. So uh, there's different ways you can orient the, uh, when, when, you, when you make the magnet itself 
a magnet consists of thousands, millions of tiny little, uh, 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 tiny little magnets that are uh, either held together by bonding method or by sintering, and uh, uh, which means they're heated to some temperature that kind of fuses them together. So when you manufacture the magnet, you no matter how it's manufactured, you can or orient the powdered magnet material the material that you make the magnet out of, which is in powder form, or uh, in the case of ceramic magnets, it's kind of like a, a wet uh, uh, clay, like clay that pottery is made from. But So it's so flexible, that and, and clay, of course, has, has particles. The ceramic magnets have particles of strontium fer ferrite that are colloidally suspended in water. So that's what makes it clay. And so you could subject all of these magnets before they're fired in a magnetic field to orient all the little magnets and it has a significant effect on how strong the magnet is and you could do that radially as you see on the left or parallel as you see on the right and then when you magnetize it you magnetize in the same direction it was oriented in and you get the maximum flux density as possible but uh, uh, oh I, I guess uh, the, I got a slide out of place there I we're talking about losses in we still have to talk about the losses in electrical steels here before we get to magnets. And the losses uh, in magnets and steels are caused by uh, uh, DFDT, changing magnetic fields, time rate of change of time, changes of magnetic fields. That causes eddy currents, that causes losses. And then that's eddy current loss. Hysteresis losses are caused by uh, reversing the polarity of the magnetization of a motor. And here's the Hysteresis losses are calculated in watts, and uh, and here's a formula for calculating hysteresis losses. And uh, this is a graphical picture of what eddy current losses are, so that's why you laminate, so that instead of having great big paths for, for uh, eddy currents, you have tiny little paths, so the magnitude of the eddy current losses are lower when the paths are tiny. So this is how you calculate the eddy current losses. So. So the losses are a function of flux density and and uh, uh, frequency, and uh, the the actual uh, losses are less than they're different than linear. There's a uh, the total losses are there's a uh, eddy current contribution and a hysteresis contribution. Uh, uh, here's a uh, now we're back to permanent magnets. Sorry for that slide being out of place, but. Uh, uh, here's a summary of, uh, of a lot of magnets, uh, ceramic grades, cast alnico, samarium cobalt, and neodymium. This certainly isn't all of them, but it's good to put them all on one chart. So uh, a, a, a maximum energy product, mega gauss orsteds, you multiply the peak uh, orsteds and the peak gauss numbers from the second quadrant BH curve, you multiply those together to get the biggest number, biggest multipl multiplier of those two uh, values, and, and that's how they compare magnets. It, years ago, that was important. You used to design the magnetic circuit in, in, to operate at the maximum energy product, but you don't do that anymore. Uh, the, this, uh, this next column, this is the residual flux density if the magnet is in a closed circuit with no, no air gap. That's the maximum flux density you can get off the surface of a magnet made with these grades. And the coercive force is its, uh, its, its resistance or ability to, to be what it takes to demagnetize it. And uh, then this final column, the most important one, is the working temperatures of these magnets. And that's certainly important because uh, uh, ceramics operate pretty well at high temperatures. They're not so good at low temperatures, but they're very good at high temperatures. Samarium cobalt is fantastic at high temperatures. The highest temperature magnet we know is 550 degrees C. That's a samarium cobalt uh, 2-17 magnet. It's only made by one company as far as I know. But neodymium magnets have very poor temperature characteristics in operating uh, the the uh, here's here's a list of the neodymium grades, and this suffix here defines the maximum working temperature. Uh, so this EH grade it will operate at 200 degrees C, but it's uh, it's uh, reduced flux there, and uh, it's very expensive. So 
you have to be very careful in using these neodymium magnets. Here's a plot of the BH curves that puts, uh, puts some of them on the same curve. I have several of these. The Alnico BH curve looks like this. It has very high f uh, residual flux density, but very low coercivity resistance to demagnetization. Uh, the, uh, the, some of the ceramic magnets have been around for years. Ferrite magnets made of strontium ferrite. They, they have uh, pretty, pretty good performance, but low flux density compared to the Alnico. Then in, in here you have the, uh, the samarium cobalt magnet is this one. They're, they're all in that range, right around one, one Tesla, a little over Tesla. High temperature ones, a 0.9 Tesla. And then you have the, uh, the, uh, the rest of these. These two are, are bonded uh, uh, neodymium boron iron, uh, MQ. That means magnet quench grade. That uh, used to be a division of General Motors. But most of the cindered grades then come up here. As you can see, they produce high flux density. And by the way, all of these plots are at 20 degrees centigrade. We'll talk more about that in a minute. So you're, we're comparing them all at 20 degrees centigrade. It gives you an idea of where these magnets are. Here is a, uh, 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 I think is very exciting and encouraging is a, a couple of companies, Hitachi and TDK, have both uh, spent some research and developed some uh, ceramic magnets. Notice the, the residual induction is 0.4 Tesla here. Uh, and those magnets are, you know, we should, I guess we should have a price. We almost have sort of a price on these. The ceramic magnets are real cheap. This one's real cheap. The bonded aren't too bad. The samarium cobalt and the neo, they're pretty expensive. Samarium is a little higher than neo, depending on what grade you get. But uh, uh, so two companies, TDK and Natachi, have developed uh, some new high high performance ceramic grades, which I think is very impressive. This has a uh, uh, residual flux uh, density at 20 degrees C of about 0.46 Tesla. Now, it's, if, if you, uh, if you uh, in, in a cold environment, it's even uh, higher than that, but uh, that's quite impressive. That makes it very, and, and remember, this is a two or three dollar a pound magnet. It's a very cheap magnet, so that makes it very interesting to try that, to see how you might use a lot of that low cost magnet in a, in a configuration where you could use a lot of surface area. So, you don't have a high flux density, but you, you, if you have enough, uh, use enough of the face of the magnet, you have a lot of flux. So you can get a lot of flux and use some soft iron pole pieces to focus that. We'll look at some designs like that. So this is an important invention that you should all be aware of, that they're, they are continually improving the flux density of ceramics as well. And this is a very significant improvement. It's over a 10% improvement. I think it's fantastic, worth considering. And here's another summary of these of the uh, of the various grades of, of magnets: the Alnico ceramics and the bonded magnets, and uh, and the neodymium magnets. Here, there's no. I guess there's no samarium cobalt on this chart, but uh, there's your energy products again. And the recoil permeabilities, of coercivity, and the remnant flux. Uh, now the uh, uh, here's a this is a chart to compare the low cost magnets. And and this I think this is important to a lot of motor designers these days with the cost of magnets going up. Here's our classic ceramic uh, ferrite magnet here. And uh, this this is I don't I don't give you prices here, but but the point is you see uh, where the performance are for low cost magnets. You have injection molded neodymium that you can get this kind of performance of at 20 degrees C, and the compression molded neo grades they get a higher density of magnet in the whole uh, mix of the magnets, so you get. Higher flux density, that's a 7,000 Gauss or 0.7 Tesla versus a little over 0.5 little and over 0.4. The, with the new ceramic that runs up to 0 0.46, 0 0.47, and the difference in cost between uh, 
ceramic and this bonded neo there's no sense in using the bonded neo because you're paying four or five times the cost of the of the new grades of ceramic i think that's important here's uh a list of all the grades just for reference we're not going to go over them but here's a list of all the available grades of uh, neodymium here and you can see them and the the you can look up to see what these suffixes mean in terms of temperature rating uh, well oh, it gives a temperature rating over here yeah it gives them maximum energy product the, the uh, there's two coercivities there's the normal curve and the intrinsic curve and we're going to cover we're going to discuss that in detail and this is the, the residual flux or the flux density at 20 degrees C with no air gap. So just for you. Now here's a, a picture of neodymium magnets. Uh, that's how they come. Most of you have seen those. They're sintered and if they're not coated by the manufacturer, they're going to rust and your rotor is going to fail. Because if, if, you, if you use adhesive and glue a magnet, a, a neodymium magnet to a rotor core, that has not been conformal coated with nickel plating or some kind of epoxy coating, why it's going to rust under that adhesive and the magnet's going to come loose, so it's going to be a disaster. So you must always purchase your neodymium magnets coated, and you cannot grind them. If you, if you, well, you can grind them, but it's dangerous. You're taking a big risk. If you buy magnets that are coated, you glue them on a rotor, and then you grind the OD. To, because you want to shrink a sleeve around it or something like that. Uh, you, you have to be awful careful that the corrosion doesn't start immediately during the process of grinding or, or you're going to have a, a failure later. So that's critical. Uh, here's a list of samarium cobalt grades, which, uh, uh, and pay particular note of these maximum operating temperatures, very high here. And... Uh, 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 the other as the other important thing is the uh, the uh, uh, the loss in in remnants, the loss in residual induction. These values here will drop on all these magnets as a function of temperature. And neodymium has the has the highest drop of the rare earths per degree C, and the samarium cobalts had the least drop per degree C. So. So that turns out that's a very important consideration as well. What, what this means is that, uh, uh, that, that what this means is uh, this is a percent loss in flux per degree C elevation in temperature. And uh, what's even worse than this is the thermal characteristic of the coercivity. That's even worse with neodymium as compared to samarium. Here's an example of a uh, BH curve for samarium cobalt. Uh, this is a very good material, 2-17 material, and you have your B, your residual flux line and your demagnetization uh, uh, Orsted line. And you, you have all the curves plotted here at uh, different temperatures. You, you could see the uh, 25 degrees C is the black one. That's this one here. So that's your uh, your demag curve and your residual induction curve, and uh, the the uh, the hottest one is 100 100 degrees C. That's uh, no, that's that's the coldest one. No, that's one of the hot ones. What am I talking about? Here's 25, and you can see uh, uh, higher temperatures. These things drop down. The worst one is here is at 300 degrees C. I don't see the 300 degrees C uh, curve on there, but 300 degrees C is the worst one, and 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 you have uh, intrinsic what they call intrinsic curve plots here, and I'll tell you later with another slide what those are, and and these lines here, these are the load lines, these are the permeance coefficients here, that this is the air gap divided into the magnet thickness. And uh, the ratio of that is this number across the top, and, and those are the load lines. You can, you can, as I said before, you can get those by plotting the air gap thickness here and the magnet thickness here and where they intersect, draw a load line through them, where it intersects the, uh, the BH curve of the magnet at whatever temperature you want to look at it, you project over here, and that's the value of the flux in the magnet. But I'll show you that later. 
Uh, here's an example of uh, a very high temperature samarium cobalt. See, it starts out at, uh, at uh, 25 degrees C. It starts out at pretty good flux density, you know, like uh, 0.85 Tesla. But as it, it, when it goes up to 550 degrees C, it drops all the way down to like 5.56 Tesla. So it drops a lot, but a 550 degree C is pretty hot. And that, that's, this is for aerospace. It's a very, it's only made by this one company as far as I know. Now, uh, this is uh, an example of the, uh, how you calculate the load line and the DMAG and so on. But what the other thing that's important about this that I want to show you is this example I'm using is a BH curve from neodymium. And I want you to look at these blue curves. This one here is at 20 degrees C. That's, that, that's the one that everybody sees. And it's quite linear. It's a, it, boy, if that would operate that way over a wide temperature range, it would be great. But look what happens to this magnet at 140 degrees C. The residual induction drops, but the coercivity drops way down too. You see this shape of the curve here? And uh, if... Uh, and this, this here's my load line, the permeance coefficient. That's determined by the thickness of the magnet divided by the uh, thickness of the air gap. That's the load line. So the flux I have in the gap is this value right here, B sub G, 1.1 Tesla. The closed circuit flux density is almost 1.4. But by the time I put an air gap in the circuit, it's dropped to 1.1. So that's the value I use to calculate the performance of the machine. But that's at uh, 20 degrees C. What happens at uh, some higher temperature? As you, as you can see, it's going to, uh, uh, it, it, at 140 degrees C, it intersects right here, and it would be like uh, 1.0 uh, something Tesla. But demagnetization, I take this load line and I move it to the, I move it this way, parallel. I move it over to uh, the knee of the intrinsic curve. Okay, and, and let's say I, wa I want this to operate at 60 degrees C, so that's why I picked this. If I wanted to operate at 140 degrees, I'd have to pick the 140 degrees C curve, which is this, which means I'd move it over to there. And where that uh, intersects this uh, uh, h-axis, I'm going to read uh, Orsted's. I'm going to re read Orsted's. You know, like, for example, the Orsted's here is 557,042, and that, that's uh, 7 kilo Orsted's, and that converts to 557,042 ampere turns per meter. So I take this value, I, I, I read this in Orsted's, convert it to ampere terms per meter, and I divide the magnet, magnetic circuit path length. That's a circuit through the rotor, through the, through the rotor and through the, through the magnet, the mean circuit length of the path of where that magnet flux has to drive. And then the number of turns, I divide by the magnet path length, the number of turns, and the and and that equals the 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 demag current the that that's the maximum demag current that I can apply to to keep this from demagnetizing. If it exceeds that, it's going to push it past the knee of the curve, and you have permanent demagnetization. Uh, just a few comments about the normal and the intrinsic curve. What is the intrinsic curve? Well. A lot like this example here, the at 20 degrees C, this magnet, uh, th this is the magnetizing of, of this magnet. You see, it's been magnetized here. So, uh, uh, in w w when it's when it's being demagged by an external field, the knee of the curve is not in the second quadrant; it's in the third quadrant. So, so the intrinsic curve is a plot of adding the uh, the uh, the B and the H values together for every point on this curve, and making another plot to put it put that that uh, in the result of the adding of the B and H values, and I plot a, a curve, and that becomes this 
intrinsic curve and and that allows me to put the effects of the uh, knee of the curve up in the second quadrant where I can use it where I can uh, move the load line and find out where it intersects so uh, you can uh, uh, go through this analysis as well to uh, see how all this projects to uh, to find out what the uh, uh, H H max is in which you would calculate the current from that. So that concludes this uh, presentation.